Hi, welcome to Teardown Tuesday. I was going to do something entirely different today, but at the last minute, something turned up for repair here in the lab, and I thought, well, may as well do a teardown as well, because I don't think we've had a Swiss or a teardown of a something made in Switzerland before. So hi to all my Swiss viewers. And I like to keep abreast of different technologies, so we've got a breast pump. It's a Medela Swing breast pump, yes. Cue the jokes, but uh, it, I don't expect it to be terribly exciting inside. There'll be a motor with a uh, microcontroller to control it, battery powered, and that's about it. But uh, I thought we'd see what's inside this Swiss made breast pump and see if we can fix it. You know what we say here on the EV blog don't turn it on because we can't take it apart. And here it is, it's the Medela Swing. And this brand Medela is supposed to be the, you know, the duck's guts. This is supposed to be the Fluke 87 of breast pumps. I guess you could uh, say that sort of, you know, the de facto industry standard. It's got a tube here, which attaches to the uh, suction cup, which goes you know where, and uh, it's made and designed and made in Switzerland. And it's got four uh, soft buttons here on the top. LED, power, um, up and down, and I'm not sure what that one does. No idea. Sorry, I don't uh, go into the details of how this thing works. And it's a rather neat, um, you know, a rather neat little shape. And it actually contains the battery compartment here on the bottom. It's got a nice sort of uh, three rubber, uh, you know, feet on the bottom, molded in as one big circular ring like that. It's got a belt clip attachment and... Uh, and this just comes out like that. So that's just a, um, a friction fit uh, rubber hose there. And it's got all the requisite marks on the bottom, the UL stuff, uh, you know, double insulated, all that sort of jazz. And uh, BAAR, not sure what that is, but uh, designed and made in Switzerland. And it, I guess it uh, conjures up you know, images of this thing being designed in some mountain hut, you know, at the base of the foothills of the Swiss Alps or something like that. I don't know. And if you just lift off the battery cover here, it's uh, got the four rechargeable batteries in here, standard uh, double A's, and nice big finger holds in there. You can just pull them out. I really like that. You know, it, it really works quite well because you have to change these things every uh, day or two. They don't last uh, all that long, uh, you know, a couple of days at most or uh, something like that. And uh, it looks like there's a um, there's an air inlet there and it looks like that is, let's have a look at that. Aha, another one. Looks like that's some sort of uh, filter, possibly. Something like that. So there's two, um, well, I presume there are, you know, uh, well, um, outlets, um, sorry, for, you know, sucking the air out. So anyway, um, there's two screws here. We can take those off and uh, we can, I presume, it'll just lift off like that. And I expect uh, there to be, you know, a motor in there with the suction mechanism. That won't be very exciting. I don't really want to, I don't really care about that. I'm more interested in the uh, circuitry and why it's failed, actually, because it actually does absolutely nothing. The power doesn't turn on. Yes, the batteries are good. So, you know, I really want to find out why this thing has failed. And let's have a look at what we've got here. I expect it to somehow separate. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whoa, hey, yep, no problems whatsoever. Oh, look at that. Isn't that... Isn't that neat? I rather like that. Look at the cable management in there. They've really, there's, that's not one, that's not some slap together, one hung low cheapy, that's for sure. And uh, as you'd expect, you know, this thing is, uh, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the top notch, the duck's guts, Rolls Royce of breast pumps. So that's rather, there's the, uh, yeah, there's the rubber membrane on there. We've got uh, three uh, carbonized uh, conductive contacts there. Nice, they've put three. And that looks like really good quality gold plating on that board too. They've got white solder mask on it. But uh, the gold plating looks thick and 
high quality as you'd uh, expect. But what I really like here is this cable management. Look, it's all molded. This is all looks like one big molded plastic piece. And they've gone to the effort to mold in all the individual uh, stress retainers there and management for the individual wires coming out. They've cut them all to the exact length. Look at that. They've put little hooks under there to, you know, so that they're actually, you know, so that the uh, wire doesn't flap around so it doesn't get caught when you put the, you know, when you put the top on and get pinched and things like that. I've seen so many products fall down in that area actually where they just have loose wires running all over the place and then when you assemble the thing they get pinched or, you know, uh, it's just yeah, horrible. But this one is beautiful. Look, it's exact length. There's another cable management hook there. Lovely. Oh man, it's beautiful. I really, I, I just love that from a cable management perspective. They put a lot of effort. There's, there's another one down in there, little, you know, little pinch in there and there to keep the cable in place. Beautiful. Oh, and also clearly what they've got is there's the LED in the center of the board there. You can see that, that that's a reverse mount LED exactly like I have on my microcurrent. If you've, you've seen my microcurrent, no doubt, there we go. It's got a reverse mount LED on it poking through the, well, what this, you know, I can call it the front side of the board, I guess, with all the components mounted on the back. And uh, that just uh, shines through and uses um, the rubber here as a little uh, light pipe kind of thing. So it just shines out there. They've got the uh, alignment holes there. They've got three of them. They haven't got, f there's not four, so you, it's not like you can accidentally assemble it the wrong way and waste time in production because somebody, you know, assembled it back to front or it even ships out be, and, you know, the plus button becomes the power button or something like that. That, that. that would be a trap, actually, for when you have a symmetrical design like this. If you didn't have your three keys, you know, your little keyholes mounted like that, this could be mounted any way, you know, if you had four of them. Eh, you could fail dismally. But anyway, let's, I assume the board just pops. Yes, it does. It just pops out. Ta-da. And just the board mounting is all molded into the one big plastic case there. This is really beautiful, really solid. And the uh, PCB supports are also molded in to there as well. This is great stuff. And there's the cable management pass. Well, what we're interested in is the board. And that's uh, pretty much what I expected. We've clearly got a mi main microcontroller here. We'll take a look at these in more detail. Another SO8 package, a six pin SOT uh, 23 there, a couple of diodes, and uh, one big uh, tantalum, surface mount tantalum there, another diode in there, a few odd passives. And uh, I love the uh, programming uh, port here. This is clearly like a uh, JTAG, or an in-circuit uh, serial programming port for the microcontroller so they can screw this thing in unprogrammed and then during production uh, process of this thing they can just plug up their hook up their little custom-made uh, uh, you know probe thing here and and just uh, program this thing and uh, do in-circuit uh, testing maybe as well or you know run some operational tests or things like that so um, yeah, we've, something on, on here has failed, by the way. I'm, I'm not sure what. It's certainly not the uh, wiring. It's not like a, you know, wiring's come loose or anything. These are all uh, hand-soldered onto here, but they look hand-soldered on beautifully, as you'd expect in this Swiss made, you know. Someone in the Swiss Alps is there rubbing, rubbing their grey beard and they're soldering each one at the right tongue angle. Oh, beautiful. Anyway, the quality of construction is excellent. Let's take a look in some more detail. Now, one of the first things I see, I just went, aha, this little sucker down here, if we zoom in on this, because we're gonna, I'll look at the components later, other components, but this immediately drew my eye. It's got 1.5 written on the side of it, and for all the world, that little puppy there looks like a surface mount fuse, 1.5 amps, presumably, and I think there's a very high likelihood that fuse has popped. And you can tell it's an input fuse here because red and black, of course, they uh, 
would come from the power, and they do if the, they come directly from the battery, if you follow the uh, uh, wiring on the inside of the thing. We've got a diode here, probably uh, in series or reverse protection. I'm going to have to um, check out the uh, traces on there. A bit hard to see the traces with this white solder mask on here. One of the disadvantage was, disadvantages with uh, white and black uh, solder masks. Um, they're, you know, they can be difficult to see the traces f through there. Makes it you know, harder to reverse engineer and trace things out when you're troubleshooting like this. But considering that uh, absolutely nothing happens to this thing, um, when we uh, attempt to turn it on, it's likely that uh, something has gone wrong there. And there's no obvious signs of uh, failure anywhere else. But look at that, Medela. They've got their own branded chip there. And of course, they wouldn't have designed, you know, it's not going to be an ASIC. I greatly doubt it. It's just going to be an off-the-shelf microcontroller, I would presume, which they've, uh, you know, they ordered so many of them, they just got them custom branded direct from the manufacturer. And uh, let's have a look at what this SO8 is. Perhaps an E squared PROM or something like that. And no surprises at all, 24C01, is it? Clearly an E squared, external E squared PROM for holding uh, various uh, settings. And that means that they've used a really low cost microcontroller here. You know, it's not gonna be a PIC or an, like a, you know, a, a new uh, model PIC or an Atmel that has built-in uh, E squared PROM or something like that. It's gonna be, you know, a real cheap, uh, you know, 8051 or some other uh, obscure brand. And it's a sweep elsewhere around the board. They've used large footprints there for the components, really nice. You can get in there and probe those beautifully. I like that rather than little tiny footprints because they're not, you know, this is not a dense layout, so they don't really need to do that. There's the uh, there's a 100 mic uh, 10 volt tantalum and a couple of SOT 23s. They're probably uh, transistors. There's another six pin SOT 23 up there. Don't know what that is. Could be a, a uh, voltage regulator or some such not sure although why it would be all the way on the other from the, the other side of the board from the uh, battery input here I don't know um, actually I don't see a voltage regulator around the input oh no it's probably there there it, yeah sorry that one there is probably a voltage regulator so your power probably comes over here flows over to your voltage regulator and uh, that's that and they've got it curiously They've got a MELF resistor here, a MELF package resistor, whereas in all the rest of it, they just use standard, you know, 0805 package resistors. But they've just got one, which is a MELF. And uh, clearly they've uh, gone for that MELF package because it's physically bigger and will have a bigger power dissipation. So, uh, you know, instead of using a big, uh, tw like a 1206 or even a bigger uh, regular surface mount uh, package. They've gone for uh, one of the old style uh, belts, which you don't see uh, much anymore. So that's probably a uh, current um, uh, sense resistor for the motor. So it can, uh, uh, you know, so the software can actually monitor how much current is flowing through the motor. So they uh, that would uh, dissipate, uh, you know, a fair bit of power, more than a little 0805 or something like that could uh, tolerate. So they've uh, engineered in a larger physical package. And on second look, that's actually uh, 6.8 ohms, and uh, there it doesn't seem to be used as a current sense one. I can't see any uh, sense lines actually coming off that, so it just looks like it's a uh, series resistor there. And there's your reverse mount LED, sort of in a reverse uh, gold wing type uh, package, and uh, that just shines through the hole in the board, easy. There's a little bit of residue left on the hand solder joints there, but they look fine. And there's no obvious signs of distress in a component. I don't see any blow holes, you know, it's not like the, you know, something is uh, charred and uh, I've given it the smell test and I can't uh, smell anything wrong with it. So I'm going to, I think I'll bet my bottom dollar that fuse has popped. All right, so let's have a look at that and get in here and probe it. 
Bang, there we go, that was my finger there. And yep, it is popped. I, that is, I'm pretty darn sure that's a fuse and uh, it is open. And by the looks of the traces on there, this is a reverse protection diode after the fuse there. So the, neg uh, so the negative will be on the top side here after the fuse. So it basically got the positive power coming in through the fuse and then, so this is the rail part here and then this reverse protection diode here so the negative will be on this side so let's probe this and see if this is popped no there we go it's still 0.45 volts not a problem and if we do a dave cad drawing here we've got our battery input like this positive on the top side going through a 1.5 amp fuse pretty sure it's 1.5 amps because 1.5 is written on there and uh, that will then have a reverse protection diode going to ground like that. So if you plug this battery in back to front, if you end up with, if you have the positive here and the negative up here, then we'll get current flowing through the diode. And then your circuitry over here is only going to get a maximum of, you know, 0.4 volts. That'll probably be a shot key or uh, something like that. 0.4 volts. So your circuitry is all protected. Um, and you're going to get a high current flow through like that because uh, this thing is powered from rechargeable batteries so um, they're capable of uh, delivering large amounts of current that would certainly exceed 1.5 amps so if you put them in backwards you're going to pop your fuse and all your circuitry is protected of course but then well wah, you've popped your surface mount fuse so I don't know why they didn't like use a resettable poly switch there or uh, something like that. It certainly looks like a one-off fuse, but in in any case, it certainly uh, failed. That's gone open circuit, which is why our thing doesn't work at all. So um, I don't know if it's you know human error. They put the batteries in backwards, and this thing is just cactus. In the, if that's the case, and that's bad design, um, really. You know, I mean, it should only be for gross overloads of the load or something like that. Um, it shouldn't uh, blow when you just insert the batteries the wrong way around. That's crazy. So usually to overcome that, of course, you just have a standard uh, series diode in there like that. And then, and then that goes to your load internally. And then if you reverse the batteries here, no current flows at all because current can't flow back through the diode. And well, it's fixed, but they haven't. They've used a reverse protection diode. Hmm. Now the big question is of course, what caused the fuse to blow? Was it something in the circuitry? Has the motor done something that's caused that fuse to blow? Or is it just, you know, the batteries have been inserted uh, backwards, you know, and uh, and it's just popped it and it's bad design. Who knows? But uh, anyway, um, one way to find out is to uh, uh, replace that fuse and uh, give it a go, but there are dangers in that. If you just uh, short that out and do it again and something in here is shorted, well, you could blow the circuitry. I mean, the fuse is there to actually protect your circuitry. So really, you know, you'll, what we have to do first is check that there's nothing shorted on here. And the first thing you wanna do is check to see if this power rail is shorted to ground. And we'll do that. We've got to put our negative probe on here. By the way, if you're probing stuff like this, there can be flux residue left on these pins. That's why a sharp probe is important. You've got to actually pierce any oxidization or residue, even on your uh, components as well. Oxidization um, is a big problem when you're troubleshooting. You can't. You can easily make bad contact on there. But anyway, let's uh, measure that. No, it. Uh, yeah, that's a typical cap. It's, it's going down, but that's, you know, it's certainly not shorted. So there's nothing wrong with the input power rail there at all. And the next thing to do is just probe around some of these capacitors on here and see if any of the capacitors are shorted because a few of them are bound to be across the power rails. I mean, we've measured the input to presumably the voltage regulator over here, and that was fine. But, you know, we can do some more probing around here like we can... You know, measure across that cap, across this one here. Oh, 13 ohms, but that's probably, that's, you know, that's probably the motor or something like that. 
So probe across here, and I don't see any uh, any gross failures. You know, there's a couple more around. You probe around, but uh, if you can't find any shorts across any of your caps, then uh, you know it's it leads you towards uh, being fairly confident that uh, the input fuse has just uh, popped due to a reverse battery or something like that, and it's probably not something, at least on the power rails in this thing, that has popped that fuse. So what I'm going to do is pop that out. I'm dual wielding soldering irons here, and uh, that's the easiest way to do this, and I will just pop this sucker off. Bang! It's gone. What I'm going to do is just solder on a couple of little pins onto here so that I can insert my ammeter in there and I can measure the current going through this thing when we power it up. Alright, now what I've done is I've uh, hooked up the two test points. I've got some alligator clips here going to uh, my fluke ammeter here and we're in uh, microamp range here and I've plugged the batteries in. I mean, ideally, um, well, sometimes you want to do this test with like a bench, a current limited bench power supply, but I'm pretty confident with this thing. I couldn't be bothered hooking it up. So um, I'm going to um, be a bit brave and going to use the uh, existing batteries here and uh, try and get um, the peak current of this thing. Now I've got it switched off. I haven't switched it on yet and it's drawing about 150 microamps. Um, that, that'd be the microcontroller. Uh, just, you know, switched off waiting for those soft buttons to be pressed. And that's and that's pretty high um, in the scheme of things, you know, you can actually get a lot uh, better than that, but really you don't need to. You put the batteries in this thing, it's used practically, they're rechargeable, used practically every day, so, you know, really you don't need this thing to last for, you know, years or decades in standby, so that's just fine. So really what we want to do now is change our current jack over to 10 amps. Yeah, beep, beep, beep. Bloody default AC current. Urgh, grr, this is an electronics multimeter. Not a bloody uh, industrial thing. No, oh, they claim it is, but they've got other meters for that. It's really annoying. Um, right, so what we're going to do here is we're going to switch our uh, min-max mode on, so that will capture the uh, maximum. It can capture uh, pulses much, or spikes much faster than what the display can update. So that will uh, capture that and uh, hopefully give us our max current there, and uh, let's switch button is which. There, there we go, that's the power. I don't know what um, uh, suction setting it's set to. I haven't, I've got the tube plugged in so that we can actually, uh, you know, short out the tube, if that's the correct terminology. Plug it, anyway, we'll use that, and uh, that should increase the current draw, but here we go. Let's see what peak current we get, and, and presume, and hopefully it works. <laughs> Gee, you know. That's the main purpose. I want to fix this thing, so let's go. Oh, bang, bang. There we go. It's working. That's all it was. You can see the LED flashing there. No problem whatsoever. That seems to be working fine. I won't plug the tube up yet because I would presume that'll increase the uh, current. But let's, uh, let's have a look at the uh, max reading there. 0.56 amps is what it was... Uh, is the maximum reading, the minimum, and the average is, you know, ah, 68, who cares, but the maximum value there is 0.56, so let's um, do that again with, let's just plug this up, and I think we'll find the current increase. The sound has certainly changed, well, you, you heard it beep there, so it's obviously got a new maximum peak value there. So th there it goes again. It, it beeps when it, it detects a new maximum value. And oh, 0.58. No, no. That's terribly unexciting. But there you go. That's, uh, it's fixed it. So looks like it was only the fuse that was dead. Of course, that could be on minimum suction too. So I'll... there we go. I can hear that. Wow, really? Ramping this. That's probably. That's probably max now. I can really hear that, so let's. No, 
Uh, it's. I think it's still going to be very, very similar. Yep. No drama. But it certainly increases the uh, suction on that thing, and there is suction there. It's really good. It's working a treat. It's just switched to another mode. <laughs> it's got. That's why it's got a micro controller in here, and it's got. I don't know. Sign typically proven to, you know, suck out the most milk, I guess. It's got all these different modes, and it does seem to switch between them, so... And it's not flashing anymore, it's just uh, going single. But I'm sure if I read the uh, user manual, or actually uh, was familiar with how this thing worked, I'm uh, sure that is all normal. Now, I don't have a uh, replacement uh, fuse for that to hand, so, you know, the best I... I sort of seem to have is one of these uh, axial uh, two amp uh, slow blow types. Eh, whatever. It's better than just bodging and, and uh, shorting it out. So I might just to, to get it back up and running today, which is what I have to do. I'll just uh, whack in one of these. And if you're curious to know what rail is being used in here, let's probe one of these caps down here, and we get in. 3.8 volts or thereabouts. So it looks like, oh, no, oh, accidentally pressed the button there. It started it up, there we go. So it looks like it's a 3.8 volt rail there. It's not uh, your traditional 3.3, .3, for example. So I deem this thing to be repaired, but uh, that's not the end of the story, because um, we want to at least uh, have a look at the motor underneath this thing. I mean, I don't want to take it uh, fully apart. It won't be uh, that interesting. So let's see if we can pop it off. And what it looks like, aha, uh -huh, down in there, look at that. Little clip down in there. It looks like it, it uh, joins, it uh, clamps this top half to the bottom half there. There's probably a matching yet. Yeah matching one over there. So if I get in here, pop goes the weasel. There we go, lifted that one up. Give that a little gentle prod, aha! Uh -huh. Ta-da! Ooh, ooh, that seems stuck. There's something, something not, there's our motor. Ta-da, there's our motor. There's something not, oh yeah, there's the, uh... yep, looks like that's the, uh little plastic um, uh, rubber uh, air hose there. So, oh yeah, they're actually joined onto there. I don't want to take that apart. That'll be annoying to, ah, oh, actually it just popped off. So, <laughs> but there you go. Anyway, that's the, uh, that's the motor. Not very interesting with the, uh, and it just uh, generates uh, suction in there. So I'm not gonna tear all that to bits. This thing's fixed and, uh, Hopefully, oh, that plug needs to go back in there. Anyway, not terribly exciting. And if you actually look at the uh, wiring here, we've got two larger gauge wires here, which are clearly the uh, motor drive, and there's two black ones as well here. Um, thinner gauge, obviously some sort of uh, sense, uh, some sort of sensor or uh, something like that, coming back from the suction mechanism. That's, uh, that's what I would presume anyway. And if you're curious to see the way motor drive waveform, as I am, let's see if we can probe it here. I'll switch it on. Here we go. Whoa, hang on. Look at that. That's interesting. Wow, look at that. We've got some sort of variable pulse width modulation thing happening there in packets like that, so if we stop that, we can zoom in and see that that, no, that's pretty consistent. And then there's packets of those, so one, two, three, four, yeah, 4.3 milliseconds. And, and then it switches off, of course, during those periods, so if we really slow the sweep speeds down, we can see it switching on then off, and when it's on, that's what it's, that's what it's doing. And now what we're looking at here is the sense uh, waveform, or that uh, sense wire 
coming back. So there's a, see those spikes? We've got some over voltage spikes there. If you can see those happening. We can capture on those, of course, move the trigger level up above here, and we can uh, single shot capture one of those. There we go. So let's, let's have a look at that. Ta -da. Look at that. Beautiful. And let's turn the trigger back, trigger level back down. So that is, um, yeah, I, it's uh, some sense winding coming back from the pump mechanism, the motor slash pump mechanism. And if you want to see both of them, the top waveform there, the green one, channel two, is the motor drive waveform. And the bottom one is that sensor or something, whatever it is, line coming back. So we single shot capture that. Bam. So that's rather curious. You can see that when the pump stops, when the pump actually, this is the point where the pump stops. It's, you know, it's going through its cycles here and then it stops for its, you know, one second or half a second or whatever. Then the, the sensor is normally high when the uh, pump's on and then it starts to rise up and give a PWM output like that. I assume it's an output and it's, it's not uh, some input waveform to something or rather and then that starts to rise and it levels out until such time as it starts up again. Let's capture a big length there. There we go. They're exactly, exactly opposite. So I'm not sure entirely how these things work but maybe that's actually an out, this waveform is not actually a sense input. It might actually be an output going to some sort of valve or something like that, perhaps. But then why would you, why why would you, uh, you know, uh, pulse it like that? Why would you actually do that? I don't uh, don't quite understand. So if you've got a better idea of exactly what's going on there with that, please by all means leave it in the comments or on the forum. There you go. That is a repaired Medela. Where is it? Medela swing breast pump. Uh, not the world's exciting, most exciting repair. Sorry, it turned out just to be of the fuse. But anyway, I hope I made that as interesting as possible for a blown fuse anyway. And uh, well, if you like the video, if you like Teardown Tuesday, please give it a big thumbs up. And if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EV blog forum. Catch you next time.